uh, the prayers of God's people are tremendous and have tremendous impact. Now, I have a brother by the name of David, and David is a missionary right now over uh, in uh, Lithuania. But when he was a little boy, when he was two years of age, he had some very serious physical problems. He was in the intensive care unit for 21 days. I'm not going to go through all of that with you today. Uh, but at the end of that, God miraculously healed him, by the way. Come on, give the Lord praise today. But at any rate, during that period of time, there was a man in the church that my dad pastored. His name was Bill Algio. And Bill began to pray for my, my brother every day. I mean, during that period of time, God put a burden for David in Bill Algio's heart. Well, years passed. We grew up. We left that church. We moved away. And about five years ago or something like that, Bill Algio found my brother on Facebook and told him this incredible story that ever since my brother had been sick at two years of age, Bill Algio had prayed for him every single day of his life for over 50 years. How many of you know that's being blessed by someone's prayers? Amen? Prayers really work. That would be humbled. And I know today that if we went around this room, we would be thrilled and overjoyed as we learn how prayer has touched most of us. I mean, most, most of us in this room are, are believers, and, and I believe that we have all been blessed by someone praying for us. Does, does anybody have a mother or a grandmother or an aunt or an uncle or a dad or somebody, a pastor, a friend, someone who prayed for you? Just, just wave at me today if you've been blessed by someone's prayers. And how many of you realize that God didn't just bless us so that we could have life, so that we could have, you know, the blessings of God, so that we could receive what he did was he blessed so that, in fact, we could turn around and bless others with our own prayers. Amen? And uh, so I think that that prayer is one of the most important things that we can do as believers. And uh, I think one of the most important things we should pray about is that people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ would come to a place of repentance and find Christ. Let me tell you something, that's more important than anything else. It's more important than the new job. It's more important than the raise. It's more important than the new house. It's more important than even our physical health. Our spiritual health has to be top priority in the kingdom of God. Come on. And I believe in praying for people who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ because I believe that God answers those prayers by sending His Holy Spirit to deal with their hearts. Amen. And I believe in that. My wife's testimony, if she were here today, she could tell you that when she was a girl, she was very uh, rebellious, out on her own, doing what she wanted to do. And her parents decided they were going to fast and pray. And the ladies of the church got together and fasted and prayed for her. And oh, that made her little rebellious heart angry. But it wasn't very long before she surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let me tell you something. Prayer works. Tell your neighbor today, prayer works. Prayer works. And I, I would have loved to have been one of the disciples, you know? The disciples had a firsthand seat getting to watch Jesus as he prayed. We know that he would rise early in the morning to go and pray. He would go to bed late after praying. He would sometimes go up into the mountain to pray. Sometimes he would send his disciples across the lake before him as he stayed behind to pray. And so it's no wonder that they asked him this powerful uh, request. They said, Lord, teach us to pray in Luke chapter 11 and verse number 1. And there was something about the prayer life of Jesus that must have fascinated and amazed them. They saw it as a, a source of his power and his anointing. And then after Jesus' ascension into heaven, when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the early church in those days, that God birthed into that early church a spirit of praying and intercessions. It was their daily practice. Daily they 
gathered for prayer. It was what they did. They simply prayed when things looked stressful. They prayed when they had a, a, an emergency. They prayed. They had that habit of praying. It was a very much a living reality to them that God responds when people call on his name. And so for the next two weeks, today and next Sunday, I want to talk to you about how to bless others with your prayer. And we're going to be focusing our thoughts uh, in, in Acts chapter 12. So if you want to follow along in your notes or in the Word, you can turn to Acts 12 today. It's really a rather simple story, powerful story. It's a story about a man by the name of Peter. We know who he was. A man by the name of Peter who needed rescuing. And the church prayed and God rescued him. And I want to draw some parallels from this story to our present reality in our world today. And there are really three simple points to, that I want to share with you today. If we're going to bless others with our prayers, first of all, number one, we've got to recognize that the only hope for the world is God. The only hope for this world is God. The only hope for having a good, strong, lasting, foundational marriage, raising your children right, is the Lord. Come on. Our only hope is God. Just as Peter's only hope was God, so the only hope for the world is God. Now let me just tell you the story from Acts chapter 12, all right? James, he was an apostle of Jesus, had been killed by Herod. Peter was arrested. He was in prison, and of course, the church called a prayer meeting, and God answered and then rescued Peter. And I want to say that Peter's only hope was God, and here's why. Are you with me today? First of all, he was in a dark place. He was in chains. He was in a prison. And had the church not prayed, who knows, church history probably would read differently. So let me read this verse for you today out of Acts chapter 12 and verse number 6. I love this verse. It says, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Now, how many of you know, we all realize that Peter was a Christian, right? He was a believer in Jesus. Tell your neighbor, Peter was a believer, all right? He was a leader in the early church, one of the Jesus disciples. But I want you to be able to kind of think outside the box today. How many of you go with me outside the box just a little bit, all right? Uh, Peter's condition can easily be paralleled with the condition of someone who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Because here's the reason why. Only God could get him out of that cell. Amen? Only God could rescue him. Peter was in a dark place that night. He was chained. He was bound. Death was actually waiting for Peter if God had not intervened. And some of us, we need to come back to grips and recognize what the Bible says about those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Yesterday, as I pulled out of my neighborhood on Fry Road in Morton, there was a man standing there with the big sign up, and his sign simply he said that ignoring the cross of Jesus Christ has severe eternal consequences. He just was holding it up and I could see people reading it and I said, Lord, just bless that brother. He's doing what he knows how to do. He's doing what he can uh, to, and, and is able to do. Let me tell you something. Eternity is in the balance for many people in our world today. Where they will spend eternity lies in the balance and it's easy for us as Christians especially those who've been in the Christian way, we could say, so to speak, for a long period of time to kind of forget what it's like to be away from God and separated from the blessings and the covenant of the Lord. And so first of all here, the Bible contrasts those who do not know Jesus as being in darkness. Those who know Jesus are in the light, right? Paul describes this in Ephesians 5 and verse number 8. This is what he says. He said, for once you were in darkness. How many of you remember when you were in darkness? Come on, wave at me today. But it says, now you are light in the world. 
Amen. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 describes it like this. It says, For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son He loves. Do you remember what it was like to be underneath the dominion, underneath the reign of complete darkness in your life? And Peter was in the dark that day, uh, the scripture tells us. And the church prays. And I, I love the way this passage reads. And I, I remember going over this passage and reading this for the first time. It says this Peter was kept in prison the church was earnestly praying to God for him, and then suddenly a light shone. Oh, come on, how many of you know that's what happens when the church prays? Amen? That is what can happen when you pray. That's from the Word of God. When the church earnestly prays, when we get serious about prayer, when we really call out on the Lord, let me tell you something, God allows for the light of His grace and the light of His power and the light of His forgiveness to shine in the lives of those that we are believing God for. Come on, if you believe that, give the Lord a hand of praise today. Let me tell you, the only hope for this world is God. Now, there's a man, a Hispanic man, who I met several years ago when I was participating in a, in a pastor's meeting called Leader's Edge, and he told me his testimony when I was with him. He was a police officer. He also was a man who was involved in kind of deep in sin, and he told me his testimony of how he came to know the Lord. And he said this, he said, all I could see was darkness. How many of you know a police officer sees and experiences the pain of this world just in his everyday job continually all the time? His name was Eloy, and he was a drinker, a drinker and had been very unfaithful, and, and the life of sin that he was living had made him very miserable. And, and one day, he told me that he went to his brother's house, and his brother said, Eloy, you'll never believe what's happened to me. He said, I found Jesus. And, and of course, Eloy didn't really know what he was talking about. And, and it was amazing. His brother didn't invite him to church. His brother didn't preach to him. His brother didn't talk to him about giving his life to Christ. But he just told him how happy he was since his life had been changed. And Eloy went out from that place, and he was thinking about his brother, and he thought about his life, and he thought about the darkness all around him. And, 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 and he was thinking about the yet, and, and there was something that kept pulling him back towards his brother. How many of you know that's the Holy Spirit? Come on. He didn't know what it was. And he told me one of his favorite places that he would go and hang out was a pool hall. And he would go there for one reason, to get drunk and, and have a good time there. And, and uh, he went there shortly thereafter, and, and uh, he was intending to get plastered, you know, and he got his first beer, and he started to drink it, and lo and behold, it just didn't taste very good. He said, I couldn't believe what I did. He said, I walked around the whole night and didn't even take another sip. He said, I didn't know what was going on with me. And, and over the next several weeks, something happened to Eloy. Everywhere he went, he saw the emptiness and the brokenness of people. And he saw how empty his own life was. And he would go to that pool hall and he would look and he would see how shallow the people were. And all the time, his brother's face just coming back up into his mind. And he could hear his brother say, Eloy, guess what? I found Jesus. I'm so happy. I found Jesus now. And so one day in desperation, he went to his mother and he said, Mom, I've got to change. I've got to do something for, in, different in my life. I'm so miserable on the inside. And his mother said, well, well, let's just go to church with Eloy. And so they went to his brother's church and he thought for sure that people would reject him. He thought for sure that people wouldn't love him or care about him. But it was almost as though they were waiting for him to come in. And he was received with love. And he was received with grace. And he couldn't believe the friends that he found there. And it wasn't long before Eloy walked down an aisle and gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. But you see, what Eloy didn't realize was that there was a group of people in that church who had met his brother, and they were now calling out his name every single day in prayer. They were saying, God, do whatever you have to do so that Eloy will come to you. I'm just here today to tell you that we can believe the Lord. If we'll pray, the same thing can happen for you and for me. I believe in the power of prayer. Come on. If you believe it, give the Lord a hand today. Another comparison we can make between Peter and those who don't know Jesus was that Peter was bound. 
Acts 12, 6 says, Peter was bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. That's an adequate picture of a person that doesn't know Jesus. They're bound. They're in chains. 